Welcome to the 261st episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Bill Schutt, co-author of three thriller novels, The Darwin Strain, The Himalayan Codex, and Hell's Gate. This interview was originally recorded at the publication of The Himalayan Codex. Stay tuned for my interview with Bill Schutt. This episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro.fm. Libro.fm is the first and only company which lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. Support your favorite local bookstore and you can pick from more than 125,000 audiobooks including New York Times bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. You know who I'm talking about. But you'll be part of a different story, one that supports your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out the recommendations and curated list from the people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. There's a special offer now for reading and writing podcast listeners. Get three audiobooks for the price of one, $14.99, with your first month of membership. Just use the code RWPODCAST. Again, that's Libro.fm, purchasing audiobooks from your local bookstore, and use the code RWPODCAST. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Bill Shutt, vertebrate zoologist, professor of biology, and the co-author of the new thriller novel, The Himalayan Codex. Bill, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here, Jeff. Thank you. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about The Himalayan Codex yet, how would you describe your new thriller novel? Well, it's a story about a zoologist in 1946 who is, is sent into, uh, well, he works at, the, at what is the equivalent of the Museum of Natural History, and um, someone brings him some strange bones, and uh, they have come out of the Himalayan mountains, and, uh, and, and he's sent, he and his assistant are, are, are sent in to investigate, but it's just a cover story. The real story is that they, um, the, his supervisors in the military, have um, run across uh, a codex that was written by Pliny the Elder that details a trip that he and his men took um, at about 67 A.D. And the descriptions that are in that codex are really interesting to the military. The main reason is because... Uh, they describe a substance that can that that sounds like it can accelerate the evolutionary process. So uh, he gets sent in and uh, and runs into the creatures that that are living up in in the Himalayas and as well as the the, the Chinese who are on their way into to uh, to grab this substance as well. Great. Well, do you remember um, how you came up with the idea or the original impetus for the plot for the Himalayan Codex? Well, this is the second book in the series. You know, it's a standalone novel, but it's the second book in the in the McCready series. And and the first book took place two years previous in uh, in, in central Brazil in the Plateau region, and um, and it, and it, it's got you know some neat creatures in it as well. And so this is this, there's a cryptozoological bent to the book, um, and so we were looking to follow up with something just as interesting, and uh, and we like tripping back and forth in time, and uh, and and this gave us the opportunity to do that. So so really half of the book takes place in modern time, and half of the book takes place uh, through the eyes of, of Pliny and his men. And the, and it's kind of we found it interesting to look at the differences between the world that Pliny discovered and uh, and the world that that Mac and and Yanni uh, encounter in 1946. Gotcha. Well, I know that you've written nonfiction books and scientific journal articles. What led you to writing your first thriller novel, Hell's Gate? Uh, let's see. Uh, the the story really started when I was in that region of uh, of central Brazil, which is a plateau region that not a lot of people talk about. 
Um, and so you've got these 2,000 foot cliffs and, uh, and, and I was, uh, trekking around in there with a, with a colleague of mine and, and it's pretty desolate. And I thought to myself, if it was 70 years or so ago and you and you wanted to, to, to hide something that this would be the perfect place to do it. And I've always been a world war two buff and, um, and, and wanted to write something that had a uh, Nazi weaponry in it. Uh, some of the stuff that might've been on the drawing board. And I thought, well, all right, well, Penamunda got bombed, um, that, which was the, the rocket base on the Baltic, the Nazi w- rocket base, pretty much bombed out of existence, but they didn't kill the, 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 many of the scientists. So, so what would have happened if you'd have taken some of those scientists and brought them someplace to work on a weaponry program where, where no one was going to be able to find them? Uh, and that was really how the book started. So I, I was down in that area working on, um, on, on collecting bats, when I just said, boy, this would make a neat story if we, if we based it out of this region. So, so was it a big change for you, though, writing a, a thriller novel versus the nonfiction or, or uh, journal article? No, I don't think so. Um, to tell you the truth, it wasn't that difficult to transition for me because there's a lot of fact-finding in both of these. Of course, when you're writing a book about cannibalism, which is, you know, my book came out in February, um, you've got to go on trips and, and, and interview people and, and get your feet wet. And, and um, you know, to some extent, there's a bit less of that when you're doing, uh, when, when you're writing a thriller. But the thriller that, that, uh, that, that Finch and I put together is fact-based. So, they're, you know, we're using the, the, the technology of the time and the, and the, and the slang, and, the, and we're incorporating the music. And, um, and so there's a lot of research that's done there as well, so... Um, so you you mentioned your co-author. I'm just curious what what is the what is the collaboration process like um, in terms of uh, just the writing process and in mm-hmm. terms of the plotting and then the actual writing. What, what's that look like for you? Sure. Um, with Hell's Gate, it was probably uh, the story was mostly my story, and then we worked on it together, uh, working out details like uh, you know we would we would put the dialogue together and then work it back and forth to make sure that it, that, uh, that, it, that it sounded like real dialogue. Um, and, and with the Himalayan codex, it was more of a 50, 50 collaboration. It's not like, well, you've got this chapter and I've got this chapter. We sort of, we, you know, one person will write something and then the other person will edit it and it will go back and forth and then we'll argue about it and then wind up, um, you know, coming to a, a, a consensus in the end. Sure. Um, well, you you just mentioned a, a, a minute or two ago your nonfiction book that came out earlier this year in mm-hmm. February, Cannibalism: A Perfectly Natural History. I'm curious, what about cannibalism surprised you the most when you uh, researched the book and wrote it? Uh, great question. Well, the book spans the entire animal kingdom, and then I move into into human cannibalism. Um, the, the things that surprised me most were, were, were twofold. One is, was, was how, uh, how frequent and, and, and how common cannibalism is in the animal kingdom for all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with running out of food or, or, uh, or stressful conditions uh, uh, based on captivity. And, and that was really the party line for scientists for quite a while was that, you know, except for a couple of weirdos like praying mantises and black widow spiders, if you saw cannibalism in the animal kingdom, it was, be- it was going to be unnatural behavior. And that just didn't turn out to be the case. You had uh, cannibalism for, uh, as a form of parental care, uh, as, as a, a, a hedge against unpredictable environmental conditions, or, or even as, reprodu- as a reproductive strategy. So that was a real surprise to me, just the extent of it. As far as human cannibalism went, it was just how common medicinal cannibalism was throughout Europe for hundreds of years, starting in the Middle Ages, all through the Renaissance, and then, and then lasting right up until the beginning of the 20th century. Any body part that you can and imagine from you know, bones to guts to blood w- was used in preparations and, uh, that, that, were, you know, you know, that were consumed um, to treat any number of different disorders from epilepsy to headaches to, you know, you name it. And, and a body part was, was ground up or, or mixed into a, made into a tincture. Um, and, and this was a real surprise given the Western cannibalism taboo, which had been, so has been prevalent for, 
you know, 2,000 years. And to me, that, that taboo was, was just as interesting. How did that start? Why, why when you say the word cannibals and the ad, there's a knee-jerk reaction to it? Um, you're thinking about uh, Jeffrey Dahmer or, or those guys that were stranded up in the Andes. And I wondered, why is there this, this you know, visceral reaction to that word? Um, and, and given that we've got this taboo, um, then, then it was a complete surprise to me that, that in, a supposedly, in supposedly civilized societies that we're actually using the term cannibalism to, to, to persecute other cultures who might have practiced ritual cannibalism, it was a real surprise that, that medicinal cannibalism was, was so prevalent for so long, from kings to commoners. That's interesting. I'd never heard of that, actually. <laughs> uh, so, so are you working on another R.J. McCready thriller novel? Yeah, we're just signing uh, right now uh, for the third, uh, the, the, the Darwin strain. And we'll Great. be working on that this summer. Great. Um, so what advice do you have for aspiring writers who may be listening? Great, great question. Um, and, and this is, so when I hear that question from, from writers, my initial reaction is, is, is establish another career first. <laughs> and, and that's really, you know, to me, that's, that is, that's wildly important because the, the publishing industry is, is, um, you know, it, it, I love, I, I absolutely love what I do. And, and, and I'm incredibly lucky to be able to work with, with wonderful editors. And my agent is, is fantastic. Um, but to be able to pay the bills with this, you know, you, I, I wouldn't want to have to, uh, um, rely on the publishing industry to, you know, to pay my mortgage. So, so I would say, and, and what I've done was, you know, as you mentioned, I've, I've been teaching for a, a quite a while. And, um, I'm able to free up time now where I can do this writing and I've still got my, my, you know, my teaching career as a way to provide healthcare and, and, and a, and a savings plan and things like that. And, and, and a steady paycheck, which is generally not the case when you are, uh, when, you know, when you're going to be a writer and, 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 and only write. Sure. Sure. So, so what books, fiction or nonfiction have you read in the last year or two that made an impression on you and that you would recommend? Oh, do they have to be new books? No, no, any, no, it doesn't have to be new. Oh God. Um, let's see. Um, uh, I would say, uh, what, what comes to mind is, uh, the book thief is a, a fantastic read. Uh, the Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime is 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 a great book. Um, I would say uh, I would read uh, if you're a, if you sort of have a science slant, uh, read anything by E.O. Wilson. The Diversity of Life is one of the great books. Um, if you are into uh, biographies that you might not have read, I, I would read uh, you know Good Night Sweet Prince by uh, by Gene Fowler, the biography of of, uh, of John Barrymore, and this is just fantastic writing and. And that's really one of the key reasons I think that that I got into writing, as I've been a book lover since since I was a kid, and I was I'm always reading two or three books. Um, and and you know people ask me, well, why are you writing? I'm like, well, I've read so much wonderful material that you know mm -hmm. I've got all this stuff in my head that you know if I were to give this story a you know a, a, a try, um, you know I've got all this inspiration out there. Great. Are there any particular uh, thriller writers that you read that kind of inspire you in terms of the books that you're writing? Oh yeah, um, certainly James Rollins and Steve Barry and uh, uh, Clive Cussler. Those guys uh, they're 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 amazingly talented. I've I've been inspired by Stephen King, um, and and uh, you know on the comedic side, uh, and, I, and I like to bring comedy into whatever I write, you know, at, at least something. Um, Christopher Moore. People like that, Woody Allen. Um, you know, certainly, you, know, you're, you, you must be thinking that's weird with with the idea of thrillers. But um, you know, I, I like to, um, you know, as a teacher, I think that one of the keys is to is to keep your students entertained, and in that way, you can get your information across. And I think it's the same way too with uh, when when I'm either writing my nonfictions or, or or fiction. If if you keep things light and and keep things entertaining and and um, and and everything is not so intense all the time, then uh, I think it just makes your writing more effective. Great. 
Uh, if people are interested in learning more about you and the Himalayan co- Codex and Hell's Gate and your your nonfiction book, Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History, where can they find you online? Um, my website is www.billshutt.com. That's B-I-L-L-S-C-H-U-T-T. Uh, dot com. I'm, I'm also, uh, I've got a Facebook page, Bill Shutt author, and a Twitter account, at Dracula, D-R-A-C-U-L-A-E. Uh, and I'm also, uh, I've got a, a, an author's page on, uh, on Goodreads and, uh, and, um, and Amazon as well. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Bill Shutt, co-author of the new thriller novel, The Himalayan Codex. The novel is in bookstores now, so go grab a copy. And Bill, thanks for doing this interview. Um, Thanks for having me on your show. Take care, Jeff. Great. Hello, Discover here to explain our cash back match. Here's how it works. We give you cash back for using your Discover card on the things you were going to buy anyway. Then we match that cash back in your first year. And that's why we call it cash back match. Now to recap and say cash back one more time. We match all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year automatically. Discover. Exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. From HBO's Insecure and executive producer Issa Rae comes a new satirical true crime podcast, We Stay Looking. After investigating the disappearance of a missing black woman in Looking for LaToya, Terry J. Vaughn is back as Citizen Sleuth Rose Cranberry. Through comedy, We Stay Looking sheds light on the serious issues of systemic racism within the media and the criminal justice system. Produced by Radio and Tinderfoot TV with HBO, We Stay Looking is available December 8th on all podcast platforms. You can binge the entire season early, December 1st, on HBO Max.